Hi, I'm Lou Eisen, and this is Ring Talk. And uh, welcome to this week's edition. I'm just going to adjust the camera here just a teeny bit. Uh, today, we're going to talk about a fight that was recommended last week. Uh, uh, someone said, why don't you talk about this fight? And so we are. It's the Sam McVay fight, the heavyweight fight between Joe Jeanette that took place April 17th, 1909, 114 years ago, in Paris, at the Cirque de Paris, an outdoor stadium. The referee was Emile Metro. And it's, it's an interesting fight because a lot has been written about this fight, which is which has been untrue, uh, primarily by Nat Fleischer. I have a, a I, I, how do I say it? I, not that I have a problem with Fleischer. I, well, I guess I do. A lot of what he's written has just been embellishment. So, for instance, when he wrote about the, I was thinking about this last night, he wrote about the great Canadian fighter Jack, or George Dixon, who was the first black man to ever win a world title. And he just fabricated his background. He could have called uh, the records department, you know, uh, birth and death certificate and the census department in the province of Nova Scotia, but he didn't. So he made up this thing where George Dixon's, you know, father was a white British sailor who brought George Dixon up from Mississippi. And that's simply not true. Dixon wasn't born until 1870. The British weren't in the United States in 1870. In the War of 1812, his family, his grandparents were brought up as one of 13 families to, to Africville. And then, and then at that point, uh, his father, um, Samuel, was born and then met uh, a young African-Canadian woman years later. And they had children, of which George was one, one of them. But... Um, this isn't what Fleischer did. He just made it up. So if you read Nat Fleischer and Gilbert Odd, Gilbert Odd was a British writer, a very good British writer. Fleischer popularized the sport all over the world with his magazine, Ring Magazine, and books and that. Most of the books he had weren't were not accurate but uh, that he wrote. But the thing about Gilbert Odd, of course, was when I was a kid, his were the only books you could get in Canada. You couldn't get other very rarely could you get other boxing books in Canada unless they were really, really old. So both these men wrote that there were 49 knockdowns, 49 round fight, and, and, and that uh, 37 knockdowns, excuse me. So they said that McVeigh knocked uh, Joe Jeanette down 26 times, which never happened, and McVeigh was knocked down 11 times. I mean, Faye wasn't knocked down ever in that fight. So to say that is just ridiculous. But uh, they wanted to spice it up. How do we know what they said was not true? Well, we know because we have the contemporary reports from French reporters who were there. They mentioned um, uh, Joe Jeanette going down four or five times, you know, during the fight, four, five, six, seven, maybe, but didn't go down, you know, 26 times. And McVeigh wasn't, excuse me, wasn't knocked down at all. So uh, Joe Jeanette was born August 26, 1879 in New Jersey. He lived a long life, died July 2nd, 1958. He had 157 bouts. He won 79. He knocked out 66 opponents. He only lost nine. He had six draws, one no contest, and 62 no decisions, which was common back then. You know, if one fighter couldn't score a knockout, it was considered a no decision. He had 62, which is more than some fighters these days have in their entire career. Uh, when you look at a guy like Sam McVeigh, McVeigh didn't live long. May 17th, 1884 to December 23rd, uh, 1921. McVeigh was born in Oxnard, California. He died at the age of 37 from pneumonia. And his best friend in boxing Jack Johnson paid for his hospital care and paid for his burial and paid for the headstone. Uh, McVeigh had 112 bouts. He won 78, knocked out 60 people. He only lost 18, 13 draws, and he had three no contests. We don't know. It would take some research. It can be done, and maybe it has been done. I'm not aware of it. How many of the losses Jeanette had and McVeigh had that were primarily wins but were held against them because of the color of their skin um that's a difficult question to answer and it's a difficult question because most of the time black fighters with this kind of skill only fought each other they were, rarely were allowed to fight top white fighters 
And so McVeigh and Jeanette ended up fighting Sam Langford and other guys, Harry Wills, you know, 10, 15 times each. It, it, it was quite common. So as I said, this fight took place on a cold, windy day, April outdoors, April 17th, 1909 in France. It was for the World Colored Heavyweight Championship. And this was uh, supposed to be a fight to the finish. And Joe Jeanette was the favorite, three to four to one favorite. When you watch film of Joe Jeanette fight, especially you can see it, it's a good fight between him and Sam Langford. It's very modern style where he's sticking that jab and then he's leaning back when you're trying to hit him. And he's good at covering up. He's good at blocking shots. He's good at rolling with shots. Excuse me. He's good at rolling with shots and good at slipping shots, good at sliding shots. So he's he's... He's a really good technical boxer. Sam McVeigh was not that kind of guy. Sam McVeigh was a walk-in face-first brawler. And McVeigh was the kind of guy that would take two or three punches from you, if not more, just to land his because his were much stronger punches. In fact, when you watch them side by side, you'd think McVeigh was the shorter. He wasn't. He's 5'10 and a half. Jeanette was 5'10. So it was a soft. Maybe someone can answer this question uh, for me, but um, I swear I've seen this fight on YouTube or some other platform of these guys fighting. And now I wasn't able to find it this past week, which was rather frustrating. So this was a finish fight. This, this was, uh, there was no set amount of rounds. If it ended in five, it ended in five. If it ended in 80, it ended in 80, and it was quite common back then to have, in 1905, finish fights. Fights were guys, you know, whoever went first, whoever won by knockout, excuse me, uh, whoever went by knockout, you know, won the fight. The last man standing was the winner, and they fought for 30,000 francs, which is about $6,000, and that was a lot back then in 1909 and whoever won the fight got the money the loser doesn't get money so you know you had to win the fight i'm sure Jeanette, which was common back then would have given some money to sam mcveigh although mcveigh was broke for most of his career and died penniless uh there were about 2500 fans in attendance and you know, in France, McVeigh was treated as a god. He was treated as a, a boxing god, the king of France. And all black fighters were treated well there. They, they were stunned at how well they were treated as opposed to how poorly they were treated in, in the United States and Canada. So, you know, a guy like Sam Langford's walking on a sidewalk in France with some of his friends and his manager and he sees a white man walking towards him and, it, and just out of habit, he steps off the sidewalk onto the street, bows his head. I'm sorry, sir. And the guy puts his, the, the white man puts his hand on Langford's shoulder and says, you don't have to get off the street for me. I'm no better than you. We're equal. Please, please, sir, you know, don't apologize to me. And he, Langford couldn't believe it. He'd never encountered that before. Neither had had um, Jack Johnson, or, or, or although Jack Johnson didn't care, Joe Jeanette or Sam McVeigh. They were used to the N-word being called that every day, all day, wherever they were, especially when they're in the fight context in the arena. And so being treated that well was just something that was completely foreign uh, to them. So it was a very cold evening, and people called this the greatest fight that ever happened. And really, it, it was sort of two fights in one, because what you had was you had, uh, for the first 40 rounds, it was mostly Sam McVeigh charging in and just pounding Jeanette's body and then bringing it upstairs. McVeigh was, um, well, there's a fight with, with him against battling Jim Johnson. You can get that on YouTube. And it gives you a small, very small snippet. He was incredibly strong, big shoulders. And you could tie him up, but he was really adept at getting his arms free. 
he put his head under your chin to make your head a target. And then he would hit you with left hands and right hands. And you see in this that that there were times where against battling Jim Johnson, where Johnson hit him flush two or three times and McVeigh just smiled and kept walking for it. It had virtually no effect on him. There was another time in close where McVeigh threw a short right hand and missed and went down just from the power of his own punch from missing. So they had fought before. This wasn't the first time uh, these guys had fought. This was the third of five fights between Johnson and McVeigh. And uh, John Ant won the f- first one by a 10-round decision. McVeigh won the second by a 20-round decision. And Jeanette won this one, of course, in 49 rounds. And then the fourth one was a 30-round draw, and the fifth was a 12-round draw. I-, I just can't imagine fighting 30 rounds in a fight and then having somebody, you know, it's a draw. I mean, three-minute rounds, that's 90 minutes of brawling. And, you know, no no winner has been decided. That's rather frustrating. So they met on this night, and uh, as I said before, it, it, uh, they were 48 three-minute rounds, and uh, they said 27 knockdowns occurred in favor of McVeigh during the first two-thirds of the fight. Um, McVeigh was very strong, and so he pinned. He was constantly on the move against Jeanette. You know, it's interesting in a boxing match where you can think, and I'm not thinking from a fan perspective now, but from a fighter perspective, this is what I'm going to do. This guy likes to come forward, so when he's coming at me, I'm going to hit him. I'm going to walk him into a punch, but i got to keep circling him to force him to reset. And then the fight starts, and as Joe Lewis said originally, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. So what happens, you know, the fight starts, and you're you're thinking, well, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And the minute the bell rings, you take one step, and the guy's already in your face. He's already there hitting you. And you weren't planning on this. You were planning on moving. And your corner's yelling, move to the side, turn him, turn him. And you're trying to turn him, but you can't turn him. He's got his arm up like that or his shoulder, and he's holding you in place while he's pounding you. And, and while you're trying to get out of there, he's already rung your bell. This is 10, 15 seconds into the fight. So your plans go out the window, and this is what happened. You know, Jeanette knew how McVeigh fought. He knew he was a, a come forward brawler. That's the kind of guy he was. So what he did was he thought, I'll just come forward. You know, I'll I'll, I'll let him come to me, excuse me. And then I'll just slip and slide. You know, I'll, I'll parry his shots. Um, it says here, one of my streams is having a connection issue. Some of your streams having connection issues. Stand by. Fixed. Okay, great. Thank you. So, um, glad we got that out of the way. So, there's McVeigh pounding away on Jeanette. And Jeanette's doing everything he can to keep McVeigh away from him. He's hitting him and and he's hitting him to the body. But, you know, McVeigh's body is, is like a metal jacket. You know, it's 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 really ripped. So what are you going to do? He's hitting him in the body, and it's not slowing him down. And Jeanette's against the ropes, and he's taking shots. He's getting hit in the head. He's getting whacked, and you know, in the chin. He's getting hit in the side of the head. He's getting wobbled, and he's hanging on to McVeigh. But McVeigh is so strong, he just has to flex his shoulders, and you know, Jeanette can't hold on to him. And he's thinking, I, I, what am I going to do? This, I can't do this. I can't take a beating like this for how many rounds. I mean, he'll, he'll stop me. And they were both in phenomenal condition. They were both used to long fights. So the first round ends and Jeanette's in his corner. And he's, you know, very intelligent man, very successful after boxing. You know, ran his own gym, but also had a taxi and limousine service. Very well liked. And Jeanette is thinking, how am I going to stop him? He's, he's strong. I mean, I'm hitting him in the arms. I'm hitting him in the stomach. Because in 15 to 20 rounds, he said, I'm not going to be around that. He's just giving me too much of a beating. So what's happening is he's, he's pounding him. 
And Jeanette's thinking, I got to slow him down. If I can't stop his legs, you know, by hitting him to the stomach, although he's still going to do that, I got to blind him. That's the only way I can do it. And so Jeanette starts to focus uh, on McVeigh's face. And so he's just jabbing him. He's constantly circling to his left. And he's taken hellacious shots, but he's jabbing to McVeigh's face. And McVeigh's not making any attempt to slide or slip the shots or block them. He's willing to take two, three, four shots in a row to his eyes because he's going to come in with an overhand right that's going to rock McVeigh or rock Jeanette and drop him, which is what happened. And, you know, he, he gave um, Jeanette a phenomenal beating, a full body beating, beat him in the ribs you know, hit him in the chin. And every time Jeanette went down, you know, he, he didn't just take a knee, he was stretched. Like he was getting up, blinking his eyes, didn't know where he was, taking a breath, but he knew to take the full nine count, use the ropes to get up, and then McVeigh would charge him to get rid of him. And, you know, they said there were at least six to 10 times when Jeanette was a punch or two away from going out for good, but the bell rang. And then when the next round started, Jeanette would just run, forcing McVeigh to come after him. And while McVeigh's coming after him face first, Jeanette's whacking him in the eyes, all about the eyes, whacking him in the nose. And he's thinking, this is the only shot I got. I can hit him in the body. He's still doing that at times, but it's, you know, it's like hitting a radial tire. It's not doing any damage. I can hit it all day long. I'm not going to hurt him in the body. And, so Jeanette's just, and it was smart in his part. All he's thinking now is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to whoop this guy, but I'm going to whoop him by, by blinding him. That's all I can do. I got to make it a terrible day for him that way. So um, we know from the French sources that were writing about the fight that it was a brutal fight, and the knockdowns they recorded weren't even remotely close the number of knockdowns that Gilbert Ott and Nat Fleischer recorded because they added knockdowns. And uh, Jeanette was sprawled on the canvas. He got dropped numerous times, but not 27 times, but he got dropped a lot of times. And he just, he I, I don't know how do you get dropped that many times to continue getting up, but he did. He kept getting up. He would take the nine count and he would get up. And it's likely they said he went down five times in the 19th round alone. Now, here's the interesting thing about getting knocked down. <clears throat> when you get knocked down, um, it saves you from more punishment. So one of the comments about Muhammad Ali has always been, you know, he was the toughest guy that ever stepped in the ring. And that's true. But they said if he'd, got down, if he'd been down, if he'd gone down a lot more, he would have saved himself from being on the ropes, absorbing so much punishment. And that holds true for a lot of fighters. But Jeanette, and a lot of fighters would go down in the bare knuckle era deliberately to avoid punishment, but not Jeanette. Jeanette got knocked down numerous times. As I said, in the 19th round, five times alone, he got dropped and he managed to get up. Now, these days, he would stop the fight, but not back then. And people would were just, they would gasp at his ability not only to recuperate and come back fighting, but to stand against the ropes with his arms up and take 15, 20, 30, 40 shots to his, to his sides, to his head, just keep getting pounded. And they thought, McVeigh's going to kill him. He's got to do something. And he would try to hold McVeigh, but, you know, his arms are getting tired because McVeigh was just leaning against him and wrestling with him and, you know, breaking his arms free to hit him. And he's hitting... He's hitting him left hooks to deliver. He's hitting um, Jeanette, you know, uppercuts. Hitting him to the side of the head, which just combobulates, disorients the fighter. And uh, he's buckling his knees throughout most of the fight. But he's doing it and doing it. And you almost get a sense during the fight that, you know, you're looking at McVeigh and you're thinking, this better work. Because if you keep doing this and he keeps staying in there with you, eventually... You're not going to have anything left to do this anymore. And so, you know, one of the most widely publicized stories about the fight occurred in the New York Times, and they said it was the best fight ever in France 
since the John L. Selvin, Charlie Mitchell fight, the 39 round draw at Chantilly in 1888, which is a fight that when they got Sullivan and Mitchell got there, it was like 62 degrees. And by the time they got into their boxing trunks, it was like 50 degrees and they were fighting in 40 degree weather. And then they were arrested after the 30 round draw and they agreed to a draw because their lips were purple, their hands were blue. They were just frozen stiff. How they didn't die from the weather, no one will ever knows. Um, all accounts of the mcveigh Jeanette fight say that McVeigh had the better of the fight for 40 rounds, you know, before Jeanette really rallied. So that's, you know, 120 minutes, two hours. I mean, it's, it's like saying today, it would be like watching a fight where a guy gets hammered for 11 rounds. He's just against the ropes. He's taken a beating. And in the 12th round, he comes out and turns the tide and wins the fight. That rarely, if ever, happens. I've seen it only happen to, you know, I'm in my 60s, and I've only seen it happen a couple times. Once with my friend Mike Weaver when he fought Big John Tate, and Tate won the first 14, and then Weaver caught him in the 15th round with about 15 seconds left, you know, left hook, right hand, and Tate was out cold. But that's rare. You know, Laurent Dottil was beating, Dottil was beating uh, Jake LaMotta. We discussed that fight about a month ago. Lamada caught him with 13 seconds left in the fight and dropped him and ended up winning with only three seconds remaining in the 15th round. So that's what makes the sport so great because you can't turn away and say, well, this guy's winning a fight. It's over. I'll go look at something else. Because a lot of times in boxing, you know, you go look at something else and you missed what happened. Now, um, Jeanette was taking a tremendous punishment and, at, at that point, as he's taking his punishment, they're saying to him, uh, you know, his corner is saying, maybe you want to, you know, you did your best. Maybe you want to call it a day. Because the 21st and 22nd rounds were really the worst rounds of the fight for Jeanette because he's throwing shots to McVeigh and, and McVeigh's slipping them. He's ducking under them mostly. And because he knows, he knows uh, Jeanette's targeting his eyes. And McVeigh's coming underneath and he's hitting him to the belly. He's hitting him in the arms, but he's landing two, three, four, five punch combinations in the head. And Jeanette's trying to hold on. And as he tries to hold on, McVeigh breaks the hold, you know, steps back, hits him with the left uppercut, right uppercut, right hand, and, and Jeanette goes down. And Jeanette didn't just go down accidentally where a fighter goes down and he started smiling and looking at his corner. I mean, he hit the canvas with a thud a lot of times and he's lying there with his arms splayed and the referee's counting and he shakes his head and he just keeps getting up. And McVeigh, it had to be frustrating to him because he's thinking, you know, at this point in the 21st round, this is the fifth time I've dropped this guy. And I didn't just hit him with a fluke shot or a counter shot and he wasn't off balance. I hit him with everything I had. You know, McVeigh came into the fight and he weighed 201 pounds. He probably weighed about 205, 206. And um, Jeanette weighed a lot less at 185. So McVeigh had had the weight. He was a true heavyweight. He was pounding on him. And he was able to drop him without much problem. And um, McVeigh put in extra time in training. And he did a lot of extra running in training, a lot of extra sparring, uh, and a lot of extra calisthenics. So he was ripped, he was muscular, and he was in shape. He was ready to go 50, 60, 70 rounds if he had to. And he he uh, he seemed to show absolutely no regard or respect for Jeanette's punches. I mean, he just brushed them away like a surface nuisance, just, you know, get out of here. And, you know, McVeigh was, had been knocked out by his best friend, Jack Johnson. They'd fought before and it was a dull fight because they were friends, but going to the 15th round, Johnson's manager at the time said to him, unless there's a dramatic finish, it's likely you won't get paid. And so Johnson just went out and knocked him out. And, and when you watch Johnson beat James J. Jeffrey, he's one of the corner men to Sam McVeigh. So they were very close and they hung out together. Um, a lot and i think part of that's because you know two black men in a profession which is 
racially slanted against them. They both endured tremendous racism, but also like they never asked Johnson for anything. He never asked him for money or for help with anything. He was just his friend and Johnson, I think appreciated that. You know, the, there were four, four great fighters, black fighters. I mean, there were a lot more than that, but the most well-known at heavyweight were Sam Langford, the Canadian, Jack, uh, Jack Johnson from Texas, Sam McVeigh from Oxnard, California, and of course, Joe Jeanette from New Jersey. And you can also add Harry Wills. He's been into that. So they fought each other a lot and they had to endure a lot of racism, but each man took it in a different way. Johnson, when he, people would yell things out at him, would smile. That was his way uh, to deflect it. Didn't like it, but he would smile and then he would take it out on his opponent. And so when his opponent's corner, uh, for instance, when he fought James J. Jeffries and James Corbett, the former champ was calling him names and using the N-word. You know, during the fight, when he would hang on to Jeffries, Johnson would say, you know, I'm just going to take it out on your boy here. The more you call me that, the more he's going to get, the more teeth he's going to lose. I'm just going to kill him. You know, if you want to help him, shut up. And Corbett was so foaming at the mouth, literally, with racism, he couldn't stop himself. Langford was a guy who would read what they wrote about him in the papers. This happened in Britain one time where they said that, you know, you had a yellow streak. Langford had the yellow streak. Black boxers are supposed to have the yellow streak. And the writer that wrote it about him wrote some vicious things about him. So Langford positioned his white opponent right above where the writer was sitting in the first row and knocked him out cold into the, la into the guy's lap and then stuck his head through the ropes and said, hey, hey, mister. How's that for a yellow streak? And that was how he answered. You know, when an, uh, another corner man of a, uh, uh, of a white fighter was yelling things at him, John or Langford came out of the seventh round and touched gloves. And the other fighter said, what are you touching gloves for? You only touched gloves in the last round. And Langford said, that's right, son. But for you, this is the last round. And then knocked him out. So that, that would happen. Guys like Jeanette wouldn't even acknowledge people like that. Jeanette was well-educated, well-spoken, and just didn't like putting up with that. So he ignored it. Sam McVeigh didn't like it either, but there wasn't much he could do about it. So he focused his energies more on taking it out on people in the ring. And when these four men fought white fighters, there was a tacit agreement, maybe not so tacit, but there was an agreement beforehand that they wouldn't go out and kill them within the first one or two rounds. Otherwise, they wouldn't get anyone, white or black, to get in the ring with them because their talent level was so high. And so it would have to be seven or eight rounds would have to pass. And then they would say to a guy like McVeigh or Jeanette or Langford or Johnson, OK, you can go use your real skills now and do what you want. The other problem, of course, is when you make these agreements, people don't always live up to them. So Langford in particular, but all of them had one standing rule. I will agree to not knock you out in our 20 round fight. I will let you go the distance. We'll put on a good exhibition for the fans. They'll never know the difference. But if you break the agreement and really try to go after me, then I'm going to hurt you. And this happened quite a bit. There was a fighter, uh, Lineford was fighting, and it was another black fighter that had an agreement. The guy was terrified of Sam. But in the fourth or fifth round, Sam was just joking around. And the guy really hit Sam in the chin hard and hit him again and when the round ended sam said to joe woodman his trainer he's got to pay for that and his trainer said okay you're right he broke the rules and went out the next round and knocked him out and this happened with joe Jeanette and sam mcveigh and jack johnson a lot of those guys johnson and stanley ketchell had an agreement it was going to be a 20-round fight and johnson would retain the title and ketchell wouldn't try to hurt him but ketchell dropped him in the 12th and Johnson said, you know, you broke the agreement and then knocked him out. And the very next punch and knocked out 12 of his teeth, which you can be seen on tape wiping off his gloves. So the black fighters back then, the African-American and African-Canadian fighters, would only take so much garbage from someone before. It was like, okay, that's enough. I've done my job. I did what I was supposed to do. You didn't. You broke the agreement. Now you got to pay. These guys fought each other so often. They knew each other well. So it, 
they were always looking, you know, and a guy like McVeigh and and a guy like Jeanette had already fought each other several times. What are they going to do? I mean, you know, um, Jeanette knows McVeigh's going to come in and start throwing shots. He knows McVeigh's going to come in and, and target his head and target his arms and his body and it's just going to keep throwing shots like automaton endlessly until I go down for good. So I have to stop. And the way I can stop him is to move and keep moving around the ring, forcing him to reset, forcing him to use his legs. Of course, the problem is, is that in the first part of the fight, McVeigh's not allowing him to move. McVeigh is cutting off the ring so well that there's nowhere Jeanette can move. So everywhere he moves, he's taking tremendous shots. He's getting buckled all the time. He's getting staggered. However, he's still targeting McVeigh's eyes. He still opens a cut later in the fight. I, I, I don't know how late in the fight. I guess fifth. So it wasn't really that late. Fourth, fifth round, he opens a cut over one of McVeigh's eyes, and he just keeps aiming for that for the rest of the fight. He's aiming for both eyes. You know, he's punching him on the eye continually, hitting him with left hooks to the liver, right hooks to the body. The body shots don't seem to be doing it. anything but the punches to his eyes life out of joe Jeanette. you know Jeanette doesn't know if his plan is going to work because he's he's taken a hell of a beating and if you watch the fight with battling jim johnson um or with sam langford excuse me you see how Jeanette fought he was a modern fighter he's circling around using that left jab and when the other guy jabs he throws a shot he leans back like ali would and that would work but McVeigh was so quick and was on him the whole time that that was hard for that kind of, for, for Jeanette's defensive style to work. All he could do was stick to his game plan because he thought that's the only hope I have. I can't stand here and slug it out with this guy because he's too strong for me. So I have to figure out another way. Same way Ali did with Foreman in Zaire. I got to make him shoot his load. I got to make him tire himself out. So. What he did with McVeigh was he just kept targeting the eyes. He kept moving and kept moving. McVeigh would trap him, but he kept moving. And he thought, even if I make him move an extra two or three steps, I'm still going to tire him and force him to reset. And and fight gets down to these incremental points where you're on the ropes and this guy's hitting you with everything. And you're thinking, if I can just do one thing that would help me out, one thing. And, you know, maybe if I can just get his arm off me, move two or three steps to my left, then he's got to turn and move more to catch up with me. And then as he's coming in, I'll catch him with a jab and a right hand to the eye. And I haven't won this round, but it's having an effect. It, it not only is his cut worse, but his eyes starting to swell. And you get near 38, 39, 40 rounds, both of McVeigh's eyes are swelling. So at that point, Jeanette no, it's 40 rounds. It's two hours of fighting. Jeanette knows that, you know, he, he's having trouble seeing now. And within the next several rounds, he won't be able to see at all. He'll be blind. And he can't fight blind. He can't just stand there and keep taking punches like that. So the, the papers described it as a clash of styles. And that's exactly what it was. Because you had Jeanette, who was this superb defensive master who who was – moving all around, using angles, trying to dance away, trying to get McVeigh to lunge, to reach, to open himself up, to get countered. And and um, Jeanette was countering him quite a bit, but it didn't have an effect except around the eyes. McVeigh took the shots to the body and to his chin very well. And, uh, you know, it just... Uh, McVeigh was smart because from the beginning, he targeted Jeanette's body. He knew Jeanette was a dancer and Jeanette was going to, a great defensive fighter and was going to keep moving. And he thought, I want to get him to stick in one place. So by doing so, by doing, he did that by hammering him to the body continually over and over and over. And Jeanette's legs were going on. I mean, how much more could Jeanette take? And 
when he knocked him down, he would flatten him, and they could not believe. The audience would literally gasp. They would think, well, Jeanette's not getting up from this, but somehow he grabbed the ropes, and he'd pull himself up, and shake his legs to get some life back in his legs. Um, McVeigh landed some incredibly vicious shots to Jeanette's chin. Jeanette took them. He went down from some of them, and he also slipped some of them. But the ones that got him really shook him. They said his entire body shook like he had a shiver. And, you know, he the only thing in Jeanette's favor at that point was the fact that his counter punching was quick and accurate. He did not miss. He would always target McVeigh's eyes and it, it worked. I mean, you know, you get by the 39th, 40th round, one of McVeigh's eyes, I think his left eye was completely shut. His mouth is shredded. Now, this is an interesting point. Fighters didn't wear mouthpieces back then. Mouthpieces came in, you know, six, seven years later with Ted Kidd Lewis, the fighter from Britain who was the world welterweight champ. He was the one that wore a mouthpiece, first time ever fighter had done that against Freddie Welsh. And Welsh's corner complained, you're not allowed to. That's an unfair advantage. So he had to take it out. But later on, it became customary. So, you know, He's not only getting beaten, McVeigh, in the face and in the eyes, but his lips are shredded, you know, and they're losing teeth. And none of the papers offered any accounts of 38 knockdowns as have been claimed before. It's inconceivable that a fight would have 38 knockdowns and either fighter would survive over 40 rounds. That just wouldn't happen. It was just an embellishment. And ironically, of course, this fight made no embellishment or needed no embellishment. The other thing, too, as I mentioned earlier, was a lot of times Jeanette would get dropped and he's trying to beat the count and the count's eight, you know, seven, eight. And he's just lifted his top half. He's moving slowly. He's not going to make the count. And then the bell rings. And that's just a fluke of luck. That happened to him four or five times where... He wasn't going to make the count. He couldn't get up. And then his corner comes and drags him up and uses water, puts ice on his testicles, smelling salts, and revive, revives him for, uh, for the next round. And then you get into the 40th round and 41st round. And what, you know, McVeigh is still going, McVeigh is still going full tilt against him. You know, he's still throwing punches, but now he's missing a lot. And he's not missing a lot because he's punching wildly. He's missing a lot because he can't see. And because these guys were so tired, what they would do is the corners would, would blow into balloons, inflate a balloon, and then in between rounds put the thing in their mouth and give them oxygen that way. And that helped pump them up. And uh, both these guys you know, we're reeling through the first 42, 43, 44, 45 rounds. They're both in there. How, how, I mean, the question is, how did Jeanette make it through? Because you would think if you can't beat the count and the bell saves you and your corner's got to drag you there, you know, back to your corner, your corner didn't have to drag you there. And they're giving you, pouring water on you, ice on your testicles, giving you smelling salts and you come out, you still hurt. It's still only going to take a couple shots to put you away for good. But somehow he managed to take them. He managed to slip them. He, he managed to block them, to parry them, to grab on to uh, McVeigh any way he could. He was just fighting for survival. He was just fighting for survival. He was just thinking, I just don't want to lose. I don't want to get knocked out. And then as the fight goes into the 42nd, 43rd, 44, McVeigh's other eyes, right eyes swelling down. And now you got a guy like this. And he can't see. So he comes up for the 45th round. You know, from rounds one to 40, it's Sam McVeigh. You would give him a 40 round to nothing lead. And then from 41 to 48, it's all Jeanette because from 41 on, he can't see. McVeigh simply can't see out of his eyes. And he's doing his best. You know, he's got slits where his eyes are. But as they close for good in the next several rounds, he's just a sitting duck. 
and Jeanette now doesn't have to move around. Jeanette can stand directly. in front of him and just hammer him to the face. He's pounding him to the face and he keeps pounding him to the face. 41st round, 42nd, 43rd, 44th, 45th, you know, and now McVeigh's exhausted. You know, he went all out for 40 rounds for two hours and for the last five rounds, he's taken nothing but a beating to his face and plus the body punches have added up. 46th round, 47th round and the 48th round, you know, Jeanette did a smart thing. He would he would alternate. He'd hit him in the belly, you know, bring his arms down, and then pound him to the face. But to make sure, to guard against McVeigh throwing a wild shot, lunging at him, he just kept moving from side to side while he was doing it. And near the end of the 48th round, McVeigh's hands are down. He just can't. I don't know why the ref didn't stop it, but he, he's, he's blocking every shot with his face. And after the 48th round, McVeigh goes to his corner, and he says, I'm done. I, I, you know, and they said, no, no, you can go on. He said, I, I can't. I can't see him. I, I, I literally can't see a single thing. I don't know where he is. I I, you're talking to me and I don't know where you're standing. And his eyes are shut. His nose is busted. And that was it. You know, he, he walks over. He's guided over to Jeanette's corner. And he says, I quit. I quit, Joe. You win. And it was a great fight. Um, it was a business thing because there was no enmity b between them. They genuinely liked each other. And it was only Langford who didn't like Johnson. And the thing with Jeanette was, of course, everyone loved Joe Jeanette. So I'm sure Jeanette, you know, the rumors were that he gave him some of the prize money. I wouldn't doubt it. Uh, Jeanette was loved by everyone. And when I say that, I mean, Jeanette originally was ostracized by his family and by his wife's family because he married a white woman. But in time, both families became close because everyone loved Joe Jeanette. Black people, white people, whoever you were, skin color, religion, nothing mattered. Joe Jeanette was a classy guy that was well loved by everyone. And he did well during his career. He did well after his career. And he would help people out, white or black, didn't matter what your religion was, especially during the Depression when people had a hard time. And he, he was running a gym full time and had a taxi limousine service. He was happy to give people money. He didn't lend it to them. He gave it to them. He helped everyone out, and white or black. And everyone just fell in love with him. So you won't find anyone that had anything bad to say about him. McVeigh... Uh, never really got paid much during his career. And when he died, he was still an active fighter in his late 30s, but he was penniless, which is why Jack Johnson had to pay for his burial in New York and and, and um, his uh, headstone. There was a running battle between Sam McVeigh and Sam Langford. They were friends. But every time they saw each other, they'd give each other a key. Now, this it, it's hard to explain this without... It, it's, it wasn't a bigoted thing. Both men were black. One's Canadian, the other's American. But Sam McVeigh is often been called the ugliest man in boxing history. I don't think so. What do I know? I'm not a good-looking guy. But but um, that was a joke between McVeigh and Langford. And Langford was called an ugly guy. So because, And a lot of that, I think, was built into the racism of the day. Because when you see cartoons and caricatures of them with big, huge thick lips. I mean, it's all viciously bigoted and racist, you know, exaggerated features. And um, Langford would always look at him and say, no, no, Sam, you keep that key. You know, that belongs to you. That key was made for you. I may be ugly, but you hit every branch on the ugly tree on the way down to the ground. You even hit branches that weren't there. So this was an ongoing joke between the two, although they liked each other. You know, and Langford liked everyone that he fought. He only had a problem with Jack Johnson because Johnson agreed to fight Langford after their, after he beat Tommy Burns, he signed a contract. Contracts meant nothing to Johnson. He was going to fight him at the National Sports Center in uh, London, England, and he skipped out on it. And uh, Langford never forgave him for that. Uh, 
Jeanette went on fighting for a bit more and he was never given a shot at the title. He deserved it. But this was 1909. Johnson had won the World Heavyweight title the year before and he drew the cover line because he knew the best fighters in the world were African-American and African-Canadian. So he, he, he'd he already beaten McVeigh. He fought Jeanette and he'd lost to him, but he'd also beaten him. He didn't want to take a chance with uh, Jeanette. And, and there's a revisionist history about when he fought Sam Langford, people say, well, you know, Langford knocked him down. Langford didn't knock Johnson down. Johnson knocked him down about five, six times. Langford's manager, Joe Woodman, said that he knocked him down years later to save face. But this was only Langford's 20th pro fight. It was Johnson's, I think, 75th pro fight. But Johnson could still see how good Langford was going to be and just docked him for thereafter, though he did beat him. Um, as I said, Jeanette lived a long time. He died in 1958, two years before I was born. And he, he um, okay, Alistair, this was the show you recommended. Did Jeanette help Braddock train for Joe Lewis? No. Um, if so, that shows how relevant Martin's style was. That was actually, uh, in the movie I was in, Alistair, Cinderella Man, they show that. Ron Canada plays Joe Jeanette. But the person who trained, two people trained him, uh, Jim Braddock. One was Solly Seaman, who was the former featherweight champion of the world. And he trained him. And also um, Tommy Loughran, who, who had beaten. Um, uh, oh, okay, I'm presuming you meant train Braddock for Max Bear. You said Joe Lewis. Well, these guys trained him for Max Bear to win the title. Um, and I think Whitey Bimstein was one of the guys who helped train Braddock for Joe Lewis. But 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 it didn't make a difference. I mean, Braddock knocked Lewis down in the first round, but Braddock was arthritic. But even so, that Joe Lewis was the he was the greatest fighter pound for pound that ever lived. And so Braddock and Bear and Sharkey and Schmeling could have been in the other corner. He would have knocked them all out that night. No one beats Joe Lewis on, on a good night when Lewis is at his best. Like in the second Schmeling fight or in the Braddock fight, no one beats Joe Lewis. No one in the history of boxing going back 300 years could beat Joe Lewis. That's how good he was. And so what surprised me, Alistair, is when I watched Jeanette fight uh, Sam Langford, how Jeanette's using the exterior of the ring. He's using the ring perimeter, and he's jabbing, and he's making... He's making Langford lunge at him with right hands. Now, Langford later shortened it up. Um, and thank you. And uh, you're very welcome. And Langford learned to shorten up his shots and so he could catch up to Jeanette, <coughs> excuse me, later on. Jeanette, but Alistair, you bring up a good point. Jeanette was a modern fighter in the sense he was very smart. He was always thinking. And, you know, when you watch broadcast of fights today, they'll say, well, he's already got him thinking. And if he's thinking, he's already beat. That's not true. Ali was thinking against Foreman. I, you know, I can't dance against him. He's too good at cutting the ring off and I'll be exhausted. There's got to be another way I can beat him. And Jeanette would look at each fighter, whether it was Sam McVeigh, whether it was Sam Langford, whoever he fought and think to himself before the fight and during the fight, you know, there's, there can't just be one way to beat this man. I got to be able, there's got to be two, three, four ways to beat him. And you can't really decide on which until you see how the other man's going to fight you. And so Jeanette knew with the way McVeigh fought, just barging in straight ahead. And with his power, I can't square up against him. He's too strong. I have to get away from him. I got to keep hitting him to the body. It won't have an effect and for a long time. And by the time it does have an effect, I may not be around still. So I got to somehow, how can I stop him from landing these sledgehammer shots? Go after his eyes. If I can take away his eyesight, then, you know, his, his accuracy goes down to nothing. And I get a breather. And then I start to start the first time Liston ever got cut. You know, Angel said, go after it, go after the cut. Said Muhammad, go after it. And he targeted the cut and he opened it up and he opened it up more. And that's what a fighter does. And the minute 
McVeigh's eye starts to close, one of his eyes, in the fifth or sixth round. Not closed, but it's swelling. And 10th, 12th, 15th round, it's progressively swelling. And he's going, great. So he's just, you know, that'll affect his equilibrium. So I got to go after it more. And now he's thinking, now I got to target the other eye. And it shows you how great McVeigh was to have one eye by fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth round closed. And the other eye is still swelling. He's still coming at him and beating the life out of Jeanette. You know, you're talking fifth, sixth round, and he's still another 35 rounds of punishment Jeanette's got to take before he can turn the fight, the tide of the fight in his favor. Even with one good eye, McVeigh was still able to dish out 35 rounds of phenomenal body and head punishment. And Jeanette didn't seem to show the after effects of it for the rest of his life. As I said, you know, he died in 1958, July 2nd, two years before I was born. And uh, I know Angela Dundee and Chris Dundee told me wonderful stories uh, about him. And unfortunately, McVeigh died at a young age from pneumonia. And uh, he, you know, back then, today, fighters, if, you know, like Inoue, the monster, hurt his hand, supposed to fight Stephen Fulton. So he's going to have to take six months, eight months, whatever off to let the hand heal. But he's got enough money behind him. He can afford to do that and get the medical help he needs and live comfortably. Back then, fighters couldn't do that. If you didn't fight, you didn't eat. So McVeigh was indigent at times. He was poor, living on people's couches, you know, living outside a homeless person because if he wasn't getting paid, he had no money on him. And no one ever taught these guys. Not, not, I'm not, and I'm not saying African-American fighters. Any fighters, any athletes, there was never one because so many of them came from, you know, not just broken homes, but poor homes. So no, no one ever said, this is what you do. You take this amount to live and you put this in an annuity or you do this with this. So when your career's over, you still have money. One of the few who did that was Lennox Lewis, who got a banker and was, worked with this banker. And now Lennox has a lot of money because he was smart to save his money and not waste it on stuff. Alistair, McVeigh was so powerful, I read that he challenged Willard immediately after he beat Johnson, and Willard declined. I'm not sure if McVeigh's age at the time, but I think a prime McVeigh takes that easily. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think McVeigh would have taken Willard out in two or three rounds. I don't think it would have lasted that long. Um, I know that the fight didn't happen because at that point when Willard won, there was this it's funny to call it a gentleman's agreement, which is a figure of speech. These guys weren't gentlemen. And these people um, were not going to let another African American man um, go after the world heavyweight title. And McVeigh was a good guy. He was friendly to everyone. He never hurt anyone. You know, this was a God fearing man. And he never ended up drunk going after people or smoking or whatever. He just, a great fighter and there was no way they were going to allow Willard to beat him with regards to Willard and Jack Johnson Jack Johnson was 37 and he wasn't allowed to train properly he'd been hounded by authorities from Mexico and the United States and still went 26 rounds in 104 degree heat also because of Johnson's uh because of Willard's size and the heat Johnson who was a classic counterpuncher had to lead which he didn't like to do and so by leading, he used more of his energy. He was exhausted, and, but he was legitimately knocked out. But you're right. McVeigh was just a heartbreaking story, as was Jeanette and Sam Langford all, and Harry Wills. All of them could have been the heavyweight champion of the world. The only thing they needed was a chance. And the white people back then uh, were bigoted and vicious and racist. And, you know, by that time, you know, it just wasn't going to happen. And by the time they were allowed, African-American, African-Canadian fighters were allowed to challenge for titles, it was almost too late because even with Joe Lewis, the mob was firmly in control. And so they lost a lot of their money to the mob. Guys like Ike Williams ended up with nothing, not a cent. He was fighting for 80 grand to fight. You know, same with Johnny Saxton, same with a lot of guys, same with Lewis, although Lewis overspent his money. Um, Anyways, that's the great story today suggested by Alistair. I'm glad you joined us, Alistair. Um, if you have any suggestions out there for other fights you'd like me to discuss from Boxing's Glorious Past, please let me know. 
uh, or let Eric know. And please go to my Substack page, Lou Eisen, uh, uh, dot substack com, And I'm in the middle of a four part, five part series about the history of the mafia and organized, organized crime, organized crimes control over boxing. Plus, I just posted a, a long article on the great Sam Langford. My name's Lou Eisen. Thanks for watching Ring Talk. Alistair, thank you. As always, it's lovely to talk to you. And please come back next week. Tell your friends. And we'll see you again soon. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. And summer is going to be here soon. I'm Lou Eisen. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.